I'd like to call to order the school board meeting for the evening of Tuesday, January 13th, 2015. It's hard to say that. Um, may we please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. They're making me laugh this evening. It hurts. <laughs> Um, thank you all for coming this evening. Um, do we have any adjustments to this evening's agenda? I just have one, which is really sort of an extension of the superintendent's report, which is that we left off our library instructional technology specialist report. So they will be presenting, I guess, in advance of the superintendent's report with the concession of the board. How does the board feel about that? Feels good. Great. Okay. Excellent. Any other adjustments? Thank you. Um, before we begin, um, this is my first opportunity to address the community as the Cape Elizabeth School Board Chair. Um, I was unable to attend last month's meeting due to a um, professional obligation that called me out of state. And I just wanted to um, indulge myself for just a moment, if you would be uh, so kind to allow me, is to um, First, thank John Christie, who is the previous school board chair, for his um, tireless, thoughtful, and inclusive leadership. And John, you've left some pretty big shoes to fill, and I only hope I can live up to that expectation. Um, I'd also like to express my appreciation for my fellow board members who have put their trust in me to lead them in this coming year. So I appreciate um, your faith in my abilities. Um, and, but most importantly, on behalf of the board, I just wanted to take a, a moment to extend our sincere and appreciation for the dedication of our teachers, administrators, and staff who bring to their roles day in and day out on behalf of our students. The work is not always easy. Resources are not plentiful or abundant or overly so. And you are always racing the clock, and there's always something new. We know and we appreciate your service. Most successful organizations use the feedback that they receive from those who are on the front line. In my tenure here as chair, I would really love to open up those lines of communication as much as we possibly can, because those who are serving our children day in and day out and those on the front line have that wisdom and experience that we need to hear from you. Our, um, for those of you who haven't found it yet, our email um, link is right on our school board page and we're all fairly visible within the community and always open and happy to have a cup of coffee. Um, we are fortunate that as a community, we have prioritized the creation of a strategic plan. This plan is a common understanding of where we are going and what we dream to do. This was no small task. It has taken hundreds, if not thousands, of community hours for our volunteers to create this plan. And I just wanted to say one thing about the strategic plan by moving forward. I've had a little time on my hands lately, so I've been reading this book. It's called The Martian by Andy Weir. And I'm not going to tell you how it ends, but I can tell you my favorite line in this book is this man is stranded. Has anyone read the book? Don't ruin it. It's a good read. He's stranded on, the, on Mars, and they need to come up with a plan to get him off the, the planet. And one of my favorite lines is when he realizes how doomed he is. He says, no plan is ever fully survives implementation. And the, real, the reality is, even the best laid plans often go astray. But what's important is that we come together as a team and that we work to overcome problems together with our eye on the prize. And I'm confident that we can all come together as a community to accomplish that. And if we can come together closer, my tenure as your chair, I hope, has then can be called successful. I just wanted to thank you for that. Thank you, Joe. I didn't mean, I got a little distracted with the leaky cup over here. That's OK. Sorry. <laughs> That's all right. There's nobody fell. No one got hurt. No. <laughs> just wet. Just wet. Yeah. It'll dry. Um, may I have a motion to approve the school board minutes? Yes, I move that we approve uh, the school board minutes as listed in the agenda items 2A, B, and C. Second. Second. All those in favor? Thank you. 
I believe next on our agenda are comments from our student representatives. Um, all right, well, I'll start. We just got back from a lovely two-week break. I think that everybody really appreciated that rest. Um, in December, I don't know if it was noted last meeting because I wasn't here, but mock trial won their fourth um, straight state title, which was so exciting, and I know we're going to talk about that later as well. Um, Ms. Page does ask that they are recognized second so that she has time to get here. Um, you can do that. We are getting ready for midterms, which I think is a big focus, especially for the freshmen, getting them adjusted. The upper link program's been working pretty hard to give tips and guidance, guidance towards the most successful ways to study for midterms. Um, and then we're moving into second semester, and I think we'll hit the ground running. Oh, there's Winterfest at the end of the month that everybody's really excited about because the theme is uh, Hogwarts. Which, I mean, how can we not get excited about Harry Potter? <laughs> oh my god, I hear the theme song now. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's it? I think that's it. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, where are we? Are there any comments from the public on agenda items? Yes, please introduce yourself. Uh, William Gross from 7 View Avenue, Cape Elizabeth. Uh, I have one question on, on the agenda item. You have a schedule for the adoption of the fiscal year 2016 budget. And on that schedule, I notice it says that at the April meeting of the, of the town council, public comments are uh, allowed. My question is, during the school board uh, workshops and finance committee meetings in the February and March that are shown on the schedule, are comments from the public, uh, will they be allowed up to and including questions on individual line items in the budget? Or is that something the school board doesn't normally allow in workshops and finance committee meetings? Uh, Michael, as finance chair, would you care to answer that question? Sure. Uh, as you know, all meetings are public and we always welcome uh, community input. So you definitely are free to ask questions. Uh, we would ask. Uh, if you, the more information we have in advance, the better prepared we can be. So if you have too much specific detail, we may not be prepared. But uh, I'd be happy to meet with you or, or in any form to address any of your concerns. But all our meetings are open to the public, and we definitely welcome uh, citizen input. Thank you, Bill. That's an excellent question. Any other comments from the public? Seeing none. Um, communications. I believe we have some fun things coming up. We do, and we're going to start by recognizing the girls' volleyball team. So I'm going to introduce Coach Sarah Beckel and let her introduce her players and uh, colleague. <coughs> Thank you so much. You have to go to the microphone. I'm sorry. <laughs> Got to be official. Got to be official. Okay. Um, I didn't know I was going to have to announce anybody. Um, I'll start with uh, Katie Conley, Jr. Lydia Brenneman, you guys can stand up. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, please. Annie Ball, uh, Phoebe Coburn, Pua, <laughs> Maggie Dadman, and Monica Delaquilla. Yeah, if you turn and audience, my assistant coach, Hillary Roberts. These girls did an amazing thing this season. So. Yes, that's it. Thank you very much. Beckel, I have to say, I've you know, attended some of your games. They have got to be the most rousing, crowd-pleasing games I think I've ever seen. You guys had some real white knuckle. Can you tell us just a little bit about those last few games? Because they were amazing. Amazing, yeah. Um, Nothing short of I mean, I've, I've, I was saying to somebody today that just, just today I was at uh, Local Buzz and somebody came up and congratulated me. I was like, what are we talking about? And, <laughs> Um, it was from November 1st, which is, I mean, we're in January and people are still talking about it. Yes. Um, you know, volleyball is sort of a new sport in Maine and it's, it's, it's been growing in Cape for years and what these girls did, that playoff run, is unbelievable. In any sporting event, to be down and up against the wall to the number one seed, the four seed, and the three seed, two seed, and to win is just unbelievable. Sure. They are some of the 
toughest, hardworking girls ever. You guys never gave up, which is just so amazing. So for those of us who don't understand volleyball <laughs> very much, I, it was fun to watch, but how does that work? So the tournament was how many games? Uh, um, well, it's single elimination. You know, they do a, a prelim, but we were seated high enough so we didn't have to play in the prelim. And then, so it's quarterfinals. And we, it was tough because we had a fifth seed, so we didn't even have a home match. So we had to travel to everybody's home mm -hmm. court and to beat them. And we up against Greeley, the number one seed, yeah. down two love, two match points, and we won. It's amazing. Pretty cool. Yeah. Congratulations, ladies. Yeah. Thank you. Come back next season. It's real exciting. <laughs> I just, I just wanted to say before you go, I've sat through a lot of volleyball games. They're one of the most exciting spectator sports going. And frankly, at the finals, which I was really happy I made because you guys were incredible, I just wanted to compliment you for during that snafu at the scoring table when it was like 10 minutes of uninterrupted, uh, of interrupted play. You were up a little and had momentum. It, it was just unbelievable I've never seen anything like it and to hold your poise you ended up losing that one but you came back and I was just unbelievably proud of you so congratulations for really prevailing over a really difficult situation congratulations Thank you. anyone else want to sing their praises <laughs> thank you so much for representing our school so excellently thank you. and our our Second recognition is intended to be our mock trial team, and I don't see Coach Paige. Ms. Paige will here. be here at 7:15. We will be here at 7:15. So we're just a few bit. minutes away. Okay. okay. We could whistle, or we could yeah. move on to our we, next item. We could. We could move on to our next item. Let's do that. <laughs> okay. Um, up next on our agenda, while we wait for Ms. Page to join us, is the 2015-2016 school year calendar second draft. So in your packet is a revision to the calendar as discussed at the last meeting. It includes a proposal for five early release days for Pond Cove only. They're shown in purple on your calendar. Um, as we discussed at our last meeting, Pond Cove teachers have less collaborative planning time than their colleagues in other buildings. And so this is an attempt to provide them with some more time to address the many um, initiatives that we are working on as a district and that are um, required under state law. Do I have any questions or comments from the board? Um, yeah, I was just wondering, I think when we discussed this back in December, um, we were going to hope that we would receive comments um, from teachers or parents, and did we, did we solicit or receive any? So, so the draft is just being shared tonight. Oh, so okay. So we're not voting tonight on okay. this item. The intent right, really so is that we're sharing this okay. information tonight so that there's an opportunity for some of that feedback. Um, from faculty as well as from the okay. community okay. in order to inform your decision at the February meeting. So to just sort of expand on that, the first draft was presented at our October school board meeting. Um, the draft had been submitted after our district had been working collaboratively with our um, PATHS consortium. Um, the Department of Education, and please correct me if I get this wrong, but the Department of Education had sort of leaned on the consortium to come up with no more than five dissimilar days between all of the sending school districts so that we have common um, instruction time in which we could then send our students to paths to. And so because of that requirement, we'd actually been able to come up with a draft plan and presented it early on in our school board year. Um, it was during that October meeting that we had asked for um, feedback from both the administrators and teachers and families um, since we'd put it out at a public hearing. From my understanding, and I apologize I wasn't here that evening, um, on the evening of December 9th, we were given some feedback from the Pond Cove School, and correct me again, Kelly, if I've got this wrong, where there was a need to have some professional development days or professional planning days, pardon me, for the school. Could you tell us a, a bit about those needs, please? Yes. I think it would help for folks to understand.
Good evening. I'm a little drier than I was at last month's meeting when I was asked to speak on this. Uh, we had had a meeting, a staff meeting the, the day before, and discussion ensued around the need for more planning time. And so at that point, um, we, and Meredith had, had obviously informed us that, you know, there had been plenty of, there had been time for input. Um, but she kindly brought it to the table um, the next night at the board meeting and asked if it could be tabled and if consideration could be given. And the reason that we're asking for it is, as Meredith had expressed at last month's meeting, um, we, the elementary school has the least amount of planning time compared to the middle school and the high school. And even though on paper, even on paper, it's 45 minutes of common planning time a day, but unlike the middle school and high school, teachers have to escort children to and from. So those 45 minutes actually amounts to about 35 minutes. And when you think of, especially depending on if you're escorting kindergarten and first and second grade down to the other end of, we call it the north end of Ponca. <laughs> and for some, it's like a field trip. But it really would give us extended time, sustained time, like we had in those November days, even though it would be half days, to really roll up your sleeves, really delve into particular topics, and it can look anywhere from teams working together to K4 working together on common initiatives that we really need extended time to work on. And we have, we have faculty meetings, but that's really you know, an hour, 70 minutes max, and it really doesn't give us enough time, and it can be fragmented too, so it goes from one week to another, and even though they have team time to work on these, again, it goes back to really amounts to about 35 minutes. And it, we used to have some time, teachers used to have some time at lunchtime. That gets broken up, obviously, because of duties. And um, we just thought that this would really give us time to be able to have that sustained professional development time. We had it years ago. Many, most school districts have it, currently have it, and at various scenarios, but we'd really I'd really advocate that if you would, we would really ask that you kindly consider, um, you know, approving these these days. Um, and we will. Um, Meredith had told us we have. I, I believe it's until January 30th. We will give you a document that gives you detailed information about how we would use those days on very. I mean, not necessarily schedule, but. The, all the various uses of those days and how they would be focused on really student, student learning, it, the, the impact they would have on students who would ul ultimately be the beneficiaries. Terrific. Uh, are there any questions for Kelly? We were, we were going to ask about coverage for families and whether that was possible. Is, that, is there any update on that? Um, yes, I had a conversation uh, with Russell Packett, the Community Services Director, and actually just yesterday we had a nice conversation. He was more than accommodating. I said if we were looking at a noon dismissal, say once a month, because he saw the updated calendar, he <laughs> said we would be more than willing and more than able to accommodate that and plan various experiences that families could sign up for um, well in advance. And so would those be experiences for fee? We didn't get into the details about that. Um, I currently are. They, they usually are. are. Yeah, they, okay. they usually are. Uh, so, and I know that that's what surrounding districts often offer as well. For sure. So. Absolutely. I remember the days thinking back from when my children were in Pong Cove, which seems like yesterday, that when there were half days, there were also the ability, since it used to be a district wide half day, that we could then hire high school babysitters. Mm -hmm. I do remember that. I go back that far. Um, <laughs> I, I, I do remember that. And I, we, Russell and I didn't discuss that, I mean, um, no, but, that and, which would be separate. Possible. But um, Do you know if the families at Pond Cove, have you gotten any feedback from them? No, we haven't, we haven't put anything out to them yet. Okay. So we would, we would solicit feedback from them as well. So. And if I may just ask, I think uh, last month, Kelly, we also uh, threw out the idea of possibly um, a late start as an option or um, you know, breaking, doing it somehow differently since right. the remainder grades will be in school. I, I don't know how to, you know, if that's part of your polling with parents and teachers, but 
Um, I think we, we did. Uh, we did discuss that, I remember, at last meeting, and I, we, we had done, we had different scenarios at Pond Cove over the years, and we found the late starts were not as successful as the early release days um, in terms of getting the work done. And if I, and I, I, I can't say this um, with data in front of me, but I believe that families preferred having the, the late, um, the early release days versus the late start because then it was easier for them to arrange uh, whatever, whether, whether it was childcare or activities um, for early release versus late start. But I don't have, I don't have that yeah. data. But, but I do, we did discuss that a little bit at the last meeting. Okay. Um, Kelly, I'm always concerned about that. There are a population of kids that do well in school, and there's a population of kids who need extra attention in mm -hmm. school. Um, do you have a percentage of what our cohort is for reading recovery, for the math lab, for children who can see free or have um, transitional issues? How many of those children, how, how we can, on a half day, still provide the extra, extra curriculum? Really good question. Um, we would definitely not stray from, obviously, IEP, IEP goals. We would not stray from anything. Students would still receive those services. They wouldn't be receiving them, obviously, on those, uh, during that half day time. And we're looking at, right now, the calendar, it's, it's, it's approximately, it's once a month. So, they would still get those services, um, whether they, if it's, if say, and right now on the calendar, they're on Mondays, Monday half days. So we would make sure that those students still receive the services that they are entitled to receive by, by, compli by IEP compliance or whether it was in their individual um, learning plan. So we would make sure that, that they wouldn't lose. I know that um, schedules, you, you'd be planning your schedule, and you know, so for Mondays, not to have um, reading recovery on Mondays because those children would then not have it one time a month and their, their routine would be upset. Is that something that you can also plan into the schedule? Oh, yeah. And, so, and we do that. And one consideration, too, because we, when holidays often fall on a Monday, so we often have to plan around that too. So when a student, when we have Monday holidays, like we're going to be having next Monday, we have to plan. So in the same thing with allied arts. So if students who would, right now we're in a six day rotation, but say we went back to a five day rotation, say we would make sure that no one missed out on something. So, so we wanna make sure that everything's equitable and that students receive the services they need and no one is missing out on say, say gym every, Mon once, a, once a month on Monday. But these are all really good questions and all that we will address as we provide you with a document. And I would assume that we'd need a time for um, parents to give feedback. Um, I think we already covered that um, before we go on it because um, the past plan makes sense to me because we're doing K-12 the district. It makes sense to me to have I understand how Pond Code needs more time. I love a um, scenario A, B, and C. If you could start at 7.30 and have, you know, I, I'm nervous about half days um, for students and for student coverage. I like the fact that we have 90 minutes of reading in school on a, you know, a daily basis. I love what we, you know, I've been on the board for five years now and we've built these initiatives in that seem second nature and so taking time away out of the classroom it worries me i know that you can do it and that if you can just give us a plan that this is what we would like we're willing to compromise this is our second plan um, to be created this is the way this district does it you know to give us some scenarios so that because a full, if we're voting, it's a full year of voting. Some comparisons. And I think the way to look at it, too, is we're really lifting professional development. So we're enhancing what, we're enhancing teachers' practice. So, and this gives us that time to have really quality instruction. You know, for right now, we're, we are doing a lot now. Um, we also are having a lot of sub, sub, substitute coverage so that we can send teachers to do things. And I think you know, we would still do some of that, but this might alleviate some of that as well. 
so we see it as a we see it as a as a good way to still be able to lift practices and enhance what children are learning in a way that keeps it systematic, but at the same time, it's, it, and it is a fine line, but we want to make sure that what we're doing is really impacting students the most, and we would we would not we would not be robbing Peter to pay Paul. So exactly, if that makes sense. Um, are there any other comments, questions, concerns? Just a, just a little one, Kelly, and, and that would I, I appreciate your interest in hopefully getting a little bit of time each month. But October feels heavy to me, and with a full teacher day on the ninth, I'm thinking perhaps you wouldn't need to also add an early release after the conference weekend, because that made October pretty pretty <laughs> choppy. So either to cut it back to four or move it over to May when it's quieter would be a, one suggestion. That's all. We did look at, we had a team leaders meeting yesterday and we, we did take a look at the count. We, we did notice that and we did notice, um, actually we were, we were noticing um, possibly and actually, actually it wasn't, it was April we were noticing and that perhaps trading April or as you say October for May because there's nothing in May and May allows us to be thinking forward into next year and also how we're wrapping up and examining data for the year in May. So there are, there are variations that we could look at that would make the best sense mm -hmm. in terms of practice and the information that we need and what the purpose of those days would be time-wise through the calendar. So. Okay, thank John. you. Uh, so Kelly, I, I'm, I'm a big believer in the, in the collaborative time. I think that's I think, I think that time is, is very often very productive. I, I would just pass on something that I've heard very frequently from teachers over, it's, over the years, which is mm -hmm. that um, teachers are looking for input into how they use their professional development time. So if we're expanding teacher professional development time at, at Pond Cove by five half days over the course of the, course of the year, I just want um, to encourage you to seek teacher input into how that time is used. That's already underway. So we have we have a lot of that. <laughs> I'm sure, it, I'm that sure going it is. On. I know you don't need me to and, to. and I'm sure they will be thanking um, um, you for raising this publicly. Yes, no, they that's already underway. We had a we had a robust conversation about that at team leaders yesterday. And we've had we've had um, we've had staff meetings with lots of input about how we're going to make sure we don't miss certain topics, but make sure that our focus is is really targeted um, so that that would be a, a huge that would be essential um, to, to map it out Great. Um, strategically and align it with a strategic plan and so th there would be a lot involved um, and teachers would be right there with us doing that so it would not be a, um, a top-down um, decision on how, how we use the days I guess, Meredith, I have a question for you is, how would this be for equitable for the middle school and high school? Um, is this, are we going to have an inequity that we have? <laughs> In terms of teacher preparation time? Yeah, just, you know, uh, we're built, we've worked so hard to have um, K-12 um, <laughs> school curriculum alignment. And so uh, wanting Ponco, you know, wanting all teachers to be, um, to do the vertical and the, uh, you So know. if you start at the high school, teachers teach generally one content area. At the middle school, they generally teach two. And at the elementary school, they teach all of them. Okay. So we, know, they teach four. So I, I, I think, you know, we had a discussion at our administrative team meeting. I don't think we feel that same need. Not that teachers wouldn't always welcome more time, but as we try to balance the instructional needs versus, uh, you know, of our children versus the planning time needs for our staff, we think this is a reasonable compromise and that it is equitable. Thank you. Yeah. And then just, I want to reiterate the question only because I think I forgot the answer and I apologize if I've repeated myself, but uh, is there a plan to receive feedback from the parents and families? Yes. In Punko? Yes. And will we be able to um, read those reports or? or oh, yes. Yeah? Okay. Yes. At our next meeting. So okay. Fine. I just wouldn't want this to be a surprise. Yeah. Since we've over the years phased those out. Right. Um, fantastic. Right. Any other questions or concerns for Kelly? Thank you for the opportunity. It was really, really good questions, and um, we have some staff here who um, were were curious and um, wanted to come and you know 
in, in support um, and to hear the dialogue. So, so thank you for, and we will get that information to you for, um, for your next meeting, but we'll have it to Meredith by, by the end of the month. And so that we can be clear on process, when we come back next month, we'll have a second draft, or will that be something that we will if, be? If there is a revision to the draft, we will try to get that out sooner. <laughs> uh, because if we want feedback on that, it seems only fair to ask people to provide feedback on the intended calendar. Correct. <laughs> um, and then you'll, the intent is to have the feedback by the end of the month so that we're able to provide it to you in advance of the board meeting in February so that we can vote on, to adopt a calendar in February. In February. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, I see that we have um, our representative for our mock trial team. Would you care to come forward and sing your... I think you ought to. Come on. Really? <laughs> As it is the fifth uh, championship win for the team, the fifth, uh, fifth in a row, uh, excitement has waned about coming to school board meetings and um, <laughs> recognition. But we have Sierra and oh, we have David, God. and we're very proud of the team's accomplishments and the community support. The kids did an outstanding job this year. Uh, Sierra, do you have any comments you'd like to make about how much fun we had? Um, obviously, mock trial is very probably one of the biggest commitments club-wise in the school, but it's a blast. Every Thursday we come together and we debate a case for four hours, and it's the same case, but each year and each meeting, every, a new argument comes up and a new problem we have to address. So it's a great, I think it, for me it was great. It builds your confidence, it builds your public speaking skills, and it's also a privilege to be a part of because you have to try out to get in, and they not only look at your, um, your poise, they look at your poise, they look at your confidence, and they teach you that as well. So it, you can only get better by joining mock trial. It's truly authentic learning. David? Sure. <laughs> um, I almost corrected you. It is our fifth year in a row rather than our fourth year. But, and I did notice it coincide, coincided to when I became the coach, too. But <laughs> actually, it's mainly due to Dick O'Meara. Um, the uh, Mock trial is actually a real trial. It's called mock only because it's not, you know, for real. But there are live witnesses. There's a live, real judge. They follow the evidence rules. Uh, they do opening and closing statements. They do direct exams, cross exams. Uh, students act as witnesses. Uh, they get graded on a point scale for their presentation skills. Their um, the content and quality of their, all, all their arguments. They learn the evidence rules. It's a truncated version, but there's a lot of evidence questions. Um, so it's, it's, it's a phenomenal learning experience. But what's best about it is, unlike anything else in our school, it's not something that you can do from a cookbook or a textbook, even though I wrote a textbook on it. It's, it's really something that these kids have to learn on their feet. There's a lot of bizarre things that happen during a mock trial. Witnesses say things that make no sense. They don't answer the question the way they're supposed to. People make bizarro objections that literally you, you, you almost fall down trying to figure out how to respond to it. But these kids, nothing works according to the cookbook. So every trial, they have to think on their feet, they have to think critically, and there's no um, easy little multiple choice answer. And I think that's the great benefit of, of this. These kids, and this year in particular, we had a sort of an all-star team last year. We had mostly seniors. Who, who won the states and then a lot of them went on to the nationals. So this year, the vast majority of the kids we had were either um, very new or fairly new. We only had a couple of returning veterans. So we started off, uh, I can honestly say the first few practices were really rough. I mean, literally they did not know a thing. And it was scary, but they went from uh, being poor to <coughs> being superb. And it was through enormous hard work and a lot of critical input from the coaches and from the captains. They all handled it well. They all learned. Um, and uh, we're, we made it to the Nationals, which are going to be in North Carolina um, again. And uh, we have a very young team. 
And um, it's because of Promos, the seniors won't go to the national competition because they want to attend Promos same weekend. But also, the, we, we kind of like to have the younger ones go because it's practice for the following year. They get, to, they get to move up a role. They get to go from a witness to a lawyer or from a direct exam to doing a cross exam, which is a little bit harder than maybe a closing argument. But it's, um, it's a lot of fun to teach them. They're, they're, they're great kids. They work hard. And I, I can tell you, it's, they go from looking like deer in the headlights because it's not something you can look up in a textbook. It's not something that comes naturally to them. They actually have to think. And by the, end, by, the, by the end of the year, these kids were great. They were getting hit with things that they never expected after four months of doing it, and they, they handle it. And that's really what counts. Thanks. Thank you. We look forward to heading to nationals and delivering clink bags to all very soon. <laughs> Thank you for representing our school. Thank you so much for representing our school so well. Yes. Appreciate your efforts. Well done. Um, okay, so next up on our agenda is the proposed FY16 budget meeting schedule. Um, we've already had some comments from the public on that schedule. Do you want to go down? Or? I, I can review it quickly and then I don't know if people would have anything to add as finance chair. One of the pieces of feedback that we received last year in a discussion that we had was Geez, that overview budget conversation happens at our workshop, which isn't seen by the viewing public at home until sometimes later. It's recorded. But it's available on YouTube right. um, in our recorded fashion. So we uh, made a decision this year and with our new business administrator, who is working hard on, on this process right now, to move the initial budget meeting to um, that first February business meeting. And so then the workshops will begin with our workshop, our normal workshop series in February and continue through March. And a list of intended topics is kind of on this workshop spreadsheet, but that always is subject to change and those agendas are posted in advance. Anything to add to that, Michael? Uh, yes, I would just say, um, as always, uh, we, we can only answer questions that are submitted. Um, in other words, if you have questions in the community, uh, please, you can even start sending them uh, now so we can uh, prepare a uh, response and address your concerns. Uh, a few things we are, for feedback from last year, um, you know, like Meredith said, we are doing the initial meeting at a regular school board meeting, and um, we are looking to uh, simplify uh, some of the uh, uh, programmatic and staffing changes so everyone can see it on a, a clean sheet of paper um, and we are looking to uh, better answer the question for citizens you know how much will my taxes go up if I support the budget so uh, you know just let people know we have listened to your feedback and we will incorporate some suggestions we've received in the upcoming presentation but like I said, please ask questions. Um, you know, it's our obligation to respond to citizens. So uh, we don't know. It's hard to answer questions that we don't receive. So please email those to myself or the superintendent. Thank you, Michael. Yes. One more thing I would add. Um, our budget process begins months <laughs> earlier. Um, we started back this fall. Um, principals submitted preliminary budgets back um, before the break. And um, we are operating always with some unknowns as we do this work. And um, we learned just last week that the governor's budget proposal includes flat funding for general purpose aid. But we know that the Education Committee subcommittee report on the essential programs and services um, formula makes a lot of recommendations for changes. So we won't really know um, exactly what our funding will look like for several months yet, at least in that piece. Um, we are hard at work on enrollment decisions and we're awaiting, I'll speak to, I can speak to this a little bit later, but we're awaiting information on enrollment from um, planning decisions. We know that <laughs> our incoming class, based on conversations with them, is likely to be smaller than our current kindergarten class. And that our class is moving up from um, elementary, our classes moving up from the elementary school are smaller than the classes leaving the middle school. And our 
for, I think we've got another year where our class at the high school graduating is about the same size and after that we begin to see reductions um, at about 20 students a year. We're going from numbers hovering around 150 down to numbers in the 130s and as you know our current K-1-2 numbers are around 100. Um, so you know, that obviously becomes a conversation as we move through the budget process. So. Our staff submits budget proposals to our administrators. Our administrators then bring forward those proposals to us in December. Scott, our business administrator, works closely to sort of plug all those pieces in. We plug in what we know for information to include things like general purpose aid and health insurance and teacher salary increases, those large pieces of our budget. Fuel costs, all of those pieces, and then taking the mystery out of it. I'm sorry. Well, I I, I hope so. Um, <laughs> and and then it, it's ultimately my job to bring a budget to you, uh, where I recommend here's what we think is in the best interest of our district pre-K 12. Um, and so that's the budget that will come to you at the February business meeting, and um, we'll talk some more at our January workshop about where we see some of those drivers at this point, and um, we look forward to the conversations in the months ahead. Well, I appreciate all the pre-work that goes into the budget before it gets presented to the board. Um, doesn't sound easy. Um, are there any other questions, comments, or concerns on the proposed school board budget schedule? Okay. Seeing none. Um, the next item on our agenda are retirements. <coughs> So I've received two letters of retirement in the past couple of weeks, both of some long-time staff here in Cape Elizabeth. The first is from Jamie Michaud, who's been a teacher at the middle school for 21 years, um, an English language arts and social studies teacher at present, and uh, we wish her well. And as the board knows, and the public may or may not know, we recognize our retirees at the end of the school year, so there will be time to speak to them um, and of their accomplishments and work in the district. Um, the second letter is from our longtime volunteer coordinator, Gail Schmader, who is retiring after 26 years in the district. So um, those are both large um, wow. shoes to fill, and uh, we wish them both well in their transition. Gosh, how many of us here has Gail trained as volunteers in our district? I'm not, sure. I'm not sure there are many parents that Gail has not touched. She will be missed. Changes. Thank you. Um, and now for the fun item on our communications <laughs> agenda, the Yay. superintendent's report. Oh, no. Yay, the library instructional technology <laughs> specialists. <laughs> Brought to you by Cape Elizabeth. So for those of you who need to be reminded of who these folks are, we have with us Carolyn Young from the high school, Jonathan Werner who works both in the high school and the middle school, and Amanda Kazaka who works at the middle school. This will be the comic routine for the night. Isn't that always the first question an IT person asks? Is it plugged in? Is it plugged in? Have you turned it off? <laughs> turned it on. So I'm going to let you start talking about that. So as we kind of get organized a little bit, I'm going to be handing out um, a slip of paper that has information about our website, our digital library, so that if you would like to go ahead and see what we've been doing, you can do that. It has a big QR code on it, but if you don't have a QR code scanner, you can also type in the web address. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, my name is Amanda Kozaka. I am the middle school library and instructional technology specialist. I'm much better at saying that this year than I was last year around this time when we first came to speak to you. Again, I'm with Jonathan Warner and Carolyn Young. Um, as I said, we were here about a year ago, I think it was a little, little more than a year ago, um, to speak to the board and, and any uh, audience members about this exciting new position, the LITS role in our schools. And um, we were very excited, certainly, about um, the change 
moving forward with our library positions. Um, and we had a lot of excitement about our vision and our goals and what, what was possible ahead of us. Um, and not to say that any of that's gone, but now we can come to you after about a year and say with confidence, really what we've seen changing in our schools and our school libraries, our learning commons, excuse me. Um, we want to share some of those uh, successes with you, kind of celebrate some of the things we've done over the past year, and then let you know um, a little bit about what we're doing moving forward. Um, to start with, I, I do want to point out that last year, we relied on um, one way of, of showing our value in a traditional sense. Uh, we showed you some of our circulation statistics in the school, and we showed you how many times students visit the library, and we talked about uh, the love of, of reading and how we can support literacy and how we're joining that, um, all those traditional library uh, skills with, this, with our technology strand. Um, but I was at a Southern Maine Library District meeting, board meeting on Friday, uh, where I was fortunate to hear the um, director of the Portland Public Library talking about this very concept. How do we value libraries? How do we show our worth to our constituents and our communities and our patrons? Um, and I, I can't get the exact quote right, but he said something to the effect of traditionally we've been valued by two major concepts that we have books and that we make transactions. And we still do those things and they're fundamental parts of libraries, but it's no longer how we can show our true value. Um, and it's certainly an issue at Portland Public Library where their Wi-Fi rates are just off the charts, but our circulations are about the same. Um, we have some statistics to share with you, but we'd also like to talk about how the position's really changing. Um, and how our value is, uh, can be demonstrated through a lot more than, uh, than those facts and figures. Uh, so with that in mind, I'm going to turn over the microphone to Mr. Werner, who can talk about some of the professional development that we have done um, to really expand our goals and understandings as LITS professionals. Hello. Um, so last time we were here, we offered the Gone with the Wind version of this, and we were here for about two and a half hours. And so we're going to be very brief and give you one of each of these, and then send you to digital resources to look at the rest of them. So for example, um, and as you know me, this is very difficult, so watch me do this in 60 seconds. We went as a team to the iPad Summit in Boston. Um, over the course of the year since last I saw you, Amanda and I had gone um, and really benefited enormously from seeing so many terrific um, utilizations of the iPad. Um, about a thousand people attend at the um, Heinz Convention Center in Boston. And this year, um, Amanda and I, Carolyn and Tom Charles Trey, our colleague at the at Pond Cove, <clears throat> all went together. So now doubling our experiences there, bringing back at twice as many sort of interactions with other people that have had successful iPad programs, talking about all the different ways it, in which it can be used, K-12. Really a remarkable opportunity to coordinate and network. And as a similar example, um, when I attended a year ago, I was going sort of as an attendee. Um, after that, I had the opportunity to speak at their conference in uh, Chicago, the people that run the iPad Summit. Um, and then at this year's summit, I presented as well. So over the course of the year since we last saw you, we've each had a chance to sort of speak in a public capacity about the role of the library and learning commons. And I have yet to come up with a non-religious word for this, so I'll say proselytize <laughs> about the opportunities that a learning commons provides, the ways in which we can rethink literacy, rethink tech integration. And so now in that role as a presenter there, I got to talk to 120 people about what it's like to be a keep. So I think that growth for us has been fantastic. And both Carolyn and Amanda have had similar opportunities in other places. But those relationships and those interactions, um, you can get some sense of through the website. Um, we'll also show you in a minute our uh, Twitter accounts that have given us a public, a social media presence. But as we begin to develop the story of the Learning Commons, um, it's been really exciting to get all the national and now international feedback about how our work is mirroring work elsewhere in the country and how it really is dovetailing with 
rethinking the role of the library, as Amanda said. So now I turn it over to Carolyn, who'll talk a little bit about, we're being unintentionally political, the professional development day that we offered back in November, not knowing that that was gonna be an agenda item earlier this evening, um, and how some of the work we did outside um, reflected in our work here at home. So as Jonathan said, back in November, we were able to offer some professional development to um, the district wide for different teachers based on what we learned at the um, iPad Summit and various places where we've kind of done professional development, we were able to kind of form a mini conference on one of those days and um, each of us, we developed different sessions that we were going to teach um, based on different areas that we thought would help teachers out or teachers would enjoy and we kind of taught mini sessions on that and teachers were given hour and a half, hour and a half blocks where we kind of provided direct instruction for 45 minutes and then they were given 45 minutes to kind of explore um, the different tools that we talked about and they all came prepared with um, something to use those tools for and Jonathan is pulling up. These are some um, of the responses that we got from teachers and as you can see, um, well, sort of see on the blurry projector, 90% um, or so of people said they were either very useful or useful sessions. So we were able to kind of pull the um, professional development things that we learned and bring them in. You can sort of see what the, um, some of the different sessions were. This was just the first session that we offered and there in the second session that we offered of the day, there are different ones. So we offered things about smart boards in your classroom, appy hour, which is kind of teachers and um, other educators sharing apps that were successful for them and how they use them. Um, book reports 2.0, so how to kind of bring the book report into the modern um, world. Flipping the classroom, which was what I taught, that I thought went very well. It's kind of how to do instructional videos in the classroom. Um, as homework for students and then use that time in the classroom to actually get hands on and solve those problems with the teacher right there to ask the questions to and a number of other things and um, that went very well a lot of the teachers who gave us feedback said that they really enjoyed the time to actually play with the different tools that we showed them so the professional development that we are seeing across New England as Jonathan said we went to Boston um, we are bringing back and hopefully using in a positive way in our schools. Thank you. Uh, so back now to the middle school library and learning commons. And we're going to switch over, I think, to some photos. Um, you may have heard that we had a bit of a, bit of a renovation in our library. Um, very generously uh, funded by the Cape Elizabeth Education Foundation. Um, we had this grant sort of in the works. We've been thinking about it for a long, long time. Um, but we were, we were awarded this tremendous grant um, around this time last year and spent the summer, the remainder of last school year, redesigning our library space um, through drafts and drawings and, and concept maps. Uh, and then over the summer had the library, uh, the library space in the middle school completely emptied. We packed every book. We packed every item from our desks. Everything was gone. And we really, it was a great sort of symbolic and you know, actual wiping the slate clean and rebuilding. Um, we didn't change the footprint of the space at all. Instead, we, I, I think we're a pretty creative, innovative bunch and we, um, got a, little, a lot of input from students and staff and determined the priorities for what the space needed to provide. So instead of the library being fundamentally a place where we store books, it is fundamentally a place where students go to learn, which happens to include, at times, finding books. Uh, our Library and Learning Commons was unveiled, the new space was unveiled in the fall. Um, there's some great press about it, so I won't talk too much about it now. But the space we have available now that we use every day is very active, very vibrant. It's not a, it's not a quiet space, and that for some is still a challenge, um, sort of wrapping your head around what the change in the space means for a change in our behavior expectations. It's not a silent place, but it's a very active learning space and that is what we we know the students and the teachers need we um, we hold our staff meetings now in the in the, li the library and learning commons we have a lot of group work 
happening at all times. We have students filming videos and we have classes Skyping um, with authors and other teachers. Um, it's, it's really an amazing transition. Uh, and again, it, it speaks to this change in the field uh, of library work. Our role is no longer someone who delivers a book or you know, inspires a love of reading. Those are still fundamentally very important uh, parts of our job, but instead we're, we've created a space where students can, as we've heard other educators come up here today and say, authentically learn through authentic experiences. Um, our, as when we rebuilt the space, we also not only uh, redesigned the, the layout of the, um, the furniture and changed the kind of furniture we use, everything's mobile, everything's changeable, we uh, rearranged the collection by genre. It's a term that's um, kind of being bounced around gen to genreify a collection. Um, and though it's easy to say, oh, it's a bookstore model, it's what kids are familiar with, it's, it's easier to use. It really is um, a reflection of the proficiency-based um, learning that we're, or assessments and uh, the diplomas, really, that we're working towards. We, we are teachers, and we know a lot about the Common Core. We know a lot about the changes that need to happen in the coming years. Uh, it's a really big transition, and we see examples of how that can happen um, in this environment if you think of the old library that you walked into as a quiet space. It might have been intimidating to walk into. And faced with tall, towering, um, packed shelves of books, students ha who wanted to independently search for a book um, had to first rely on what they've memorized about libraries. Um, and we know that our students don't learn authentically by memorizing things. So did it make sense for a student to walk in and say, well, the Dewey number for sports is 796, so now I need to... That's not a process that's important. What, instead, what we want students to do in all of our classrooms, and we want to reflect that in the library, is think critically. We want a student to walk into a space that they feel comfortable entering. It's not too quiet. It's not too loud. It's just right. They, they have plenty of informed staff to help them, or they can work independently. But when, they, when they're looking for a book for independent reading or they're looking for a source of information, the way the library and learning commons is designed is, uh, helps them through a critical thinking process instead. You walk in and you see the sign, signs around the room, and you can independently start to focus. Well, I know I want a fantasy book. I'm going there. And, and you have a more focused area to work with. And then you can think about the critical thinking steps like, this book caught my eye because the cover looks great. I'll read the back. You know all the strategies, the reading strategies about choosing a book. But um, not to belabor the point, but simply rearranging how the collection is on the shelves has really changed the way the library is used. Um, I think my favorite change is, however, it, the attitude. Um, I can happily say that I have on many occasions overheard kids say, the LLC is so cool now. And that's a big shift. If, if students want to come into, the, into this space, it's a big deal. Um, so we're, we're happy. We're, we're really, really happy with this change. And we're very optimistic about how it's going to continue to help kids um, learn some critical thinking skills and, and, work, and how to work through some um, independent problem solving and group problem solving models. Uh, so I've said, I think, too much about that. We're going to move back to uh, Carolyn, who's going to talk about the virtual uh, part of our learning commons, which is our um, really great website, as we said, is, is list, the URL is listed on that bookmark, uh, as well as the QR code to get directly to it. So um, on the wall behind you, this is our website, and this is what we use um, every day. I know I use it every day to help students kind of find different information. And um, as I kind of talk about it, I'm going to post this infographic that I put together about the um, library and how it was used, how it was used in the 2014 to 15 um, year. It's smaller than I thought it would be. But this is cycling through of different things of how the library was used and um, how 
students use the library website and the physical library. And if you take a look at it, you can see that the digital library is on the rise, um, even though the physical library space is staying pretty consistent. Um, the library website itself had 36,000 visits, um, and we just created it in the 2014 um, year. So 36,000 different folks came to the library multiple times. So that was really exciting for me to kind of see the number of people that are using the library. Um, in response to that large influx of people using the digital learning space, we are, um, both the middle school and the high school, are sharing um, funds to put together something called Overdrive. And I don't know if any of you are familiar with that platform through the public library, but it is the largest um, ebook and audiobook platform for um, people who are using it and it's really really friendly with the iPads and I'm really excited about putting that out there for fiction and kind of pleasure reading um, reading on the iPads for one-to-one -one for students so that is in the very very near future I'm hopefully almost done talking to the sales rep about putting that together that's been several months of back and forth um, between she and I so that is pretty close to being um, all set um, as Amanda said, usage statistics are not necessarily exciting, but they do kind of tell you what's happening in um, the library world. Um, the most popular database that we access, uh, that we have on the library website, is something called JSTOR, which is short for journal storage. It's used a lot in the academic um, library research. That was visited 2,000 times by people clicking directly outside um, of our library website in, in 2014. Um, the second most used source um, digitally was the Gale Virtual Reference Library, which are ebooks we have just for research, and that was visited um, 900 times in 2014. Um, a database that I just recently purchased for the um, high school, which is called U.S. History in Context, and there is also a world history partner with that called um, World History in Context, and both of those were, I bought those last year in May after a trial by the Social Studies Department, and those were each visited 600 times in that less than 12 month span. So it's a very exciting time for us. The library digital presence is on the rise, so even though um, students might not think that they're using the actual library space as much, they are certainly using the digital presence of it um, a lot more than they were in the past. Uh, but as I put, have on this infographic, it just cycled through, but we did circulate 300 more books this year than we did last year, physical books, so we are on the rise there as well. Um, so I'm going to make two quick comments about one of each of those things they said. Um, in this series of photographs, this is my favorite, um, where they're standing in front of the STEM collection. Um, and these boys, um, thank you. Um, so when you look at a genreified shelf like this one, um, you're looking at nonfiction here about maybe airplanes and the army and um, engineering. And here you're looking at the um, 921s, the uh, biographies about figures who are uh, preeminent in STEM. And these four boys stood here for about 25 minutes, going up and down the shelves, and each handing one another books. And I kept going over and taking photographs and taking photographs, and I can only show you this one. But there's one actually where a boy is jumping up. He's like, check this out! And it was as if I had staged him, but I didn't. And it made me incredibly happy. So to see the way um, genreification has worked in the middle school for students has been extraordinary. Um, and as a corollary to that, I would like to publicly recognize everyone who is dealing with Thomas Memorial Library right now. Kudos to them because Amanda and I have never been in better shape than we were at the end of the summer and we had one tiny collection by comparison. Um, also, I think Amanda and I have had a lot of more public um, face as a result of the renovation. And I want to highlight the work Carolyn has done on this website, which I'm now lost somewhere in my tabs. Um, she has done an extraordinary amount of work to bring um, the resources that our students need, both to the middle school and the high school. And I hope that you'll take the opportunity to take a look at some of the resources that are available there. Um, the, there's some information specifically about Learning Commons models, but she will work individually with teachers and put together um, posts and web pages that allow them to really quickly access information. And in the way that genreification has aided our middle school students, Carolyn's work to create digital spaces for the high school students has been equally, I think, electrifying um, in terms of the ways in which students are engaging with 
um, the collection that we have and what we have available for resources. Um, so I was going to talk briefly about uh, the E-Team. Um, the, at the, near the end of last year, Jeff asked me whether um, I would be willing to teach a class, and I jumped at the opportunity. And what we came up with um, was something called Leaders in Technology and Information Literacy. So I teach an elective now at the high school, first period each day. And this semester I have 12 students, and currently this coming semester I have 10. We meet for class in the library, but then we go out and work with teachers and other students. And this is the um, Twitter page for the E-Team, but it gives you a sense of some of the things that have been happening. For example, me in this extraordinarily ugly sweater, very important moment. There we go. Um, really a, a critical moment in Cape Elizabeth history. But um, this, where we worked with students at Pond Cove um, and with Mr. Chautre, and the students on the E-Team had the opportunity to collaborate with him and with those students to put together Coder Express in December. And at the end of this month, um, also collaborating with Tom to create um, Google Apps for families. So third and fourth grade families will come to Pond Cove for the evening and learn from their own children how to use Google Apps for education. And in the background, the students on the team are helping those third and fourth graders learn how to screencast and how to create tutorial videos. So they've been doing that for the students at the high school have been doing that for several months now, and now they're teaching the elementary school students how to do that. And it is incredible to watch those collaborations and how that goes. Um, if you look at the website for the E-Team, um, you can also get a sense of some of the work that we did as a part of the professional development that we were discussing earlier. So the students on the team created a web page for each of those sessions that you saw listed. And then in many cases were available during the sessions to teach teachers what was um, being taught as a technological skill. So here under teacher resources, each of the individual sessions had a page created by one of the students on the team. And then each of those had resources that were available to the teacher. So I, um, in the screencasting session, would have gone to this page, and then all of these resources were pulled together by the students on the E-Team. So that opportunity, again, going back to this theme of authentic learning, the collaborations that have taken place, teachers teaching, uh, students teaching teachers how to use technology, assisting teachers, um, assisting their own families, that dynamic is just priceless. It is so extraordinary to watch. And in both spaces, as well as at Pond Cove, I think we've seen an opportunity to develop a K-12 sensibility about our work that we really are um, enjoying enormously and look forward to continuing to think about ways that our work becomes a K-12 experience for the district and that um, it is understood to be your library and learning commons um, from, the, from your first day at Cape to your last, having a sort of continuity to it. And I think the E-Team has given us a great opportunity to begin to explore that. Um, in the coming months, we hope to start one as a club at the middle school. And there's already a self-created Tech with Tutus um, fourth grade group that is hilarious. And they're the ones, um, if you check it, go back to this page, who created the Coder Express video to the tune of Let It Go um, from Frozen. It's Let Us Code, I think is what it's called. It's pretty fantastic. Okay. So some next steps. Couple last couple minutes to talk about what we're um, what's coming down the road for us. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, being involved with the Southern Maine Library District Board and the Maine Association of School Library Board, uh, School Libraries Board. Um, it's, it's kind of a big deal that we have a learning commons. It's not unheard of. In Maine, there are a lot of li uh, school libraries now that are um, redesigning their space and redefining themselves as learning commons. Um, we're not the trendsetters, but we're certainly um, sort of ahead of the game a little bit. And, and our success with our learning commons, especially because it's a learning commons that was built within an existing space versus um, in some of our nearby districts where the learning commons was built as part of a brand new building, 
Um, thank you. Um, it's we are really looking at opportunities to celebrate this space and use it to um, help um, inform other librarians and other uh, technology integrators throughout the, the uh, state, other teachers as well, um, on how to provide such opportuni opportunities in such a space. Um, so with that in mind, we have offered to host this year's Mazel Spring Fling which will be held on April 11th. Um, Mazel has, a, has two um, statewide conferences every year, a, um, a fall joint conference with um, the Maine Library Association and then our Spring Fling. Um, and last year I was involved in presenting for their Spring Fling and I remember thinking after spending so much time creating this really great slideshow that, boy, I sure spent a lot of time talking and this, they really needed more time to dig in. and. Um, thinking about revamping the conference model and thinking about using our library common space. We have a really exciting um, conference planned uh, with four different strands of learning, including teaching innovation, technology integration, um, professional development and professional learning networks for library staff, um, and our literacy strand because at the same time that the spring fling will be held at the middle school library and Le learning commons we'll be having our author fest at the high school we think that that timing is um, just an amazing opportunity to get librarians and teachers from around the state who are interested in attending spring fling to also stop in at our author fest it's a really unique opportunity um, we are very fortunate that for the Spring Fling, um, for our teaching innovation strand, we will have Dr. David Lorcher uh, presenting. Uh, David Lorcher is pretty much considered the pioneer in the Learning Commons movement. He's written a number of books. He's a uh, library science uh, professor out west. Um, and he is so impressed with what's happening in Maine with the Learning Commons movement that he has offered to come and present at this session. So um, it's a great chance for us to not only show off our Learning Commons to him, but have him use it to, um, to demonstrate what's possible um, in, our, in our spaces and with our, um, our, the resources that we are lucky to have here in the state. Um, and you'll see a number of resources. He was the one who developed the idea of the Learning Commons nationally so his article is linked there flip this library in the what in the library website and the idea that he would come and speak in the space it's yeah. amazing yeah. <laughs> We're very so those are some really exciting um calendar events for us um in regards to our professional library work some other you already did over spoke that over right. um, so i'll finish by saying um that I think a, a, another great example has been the opportunity to host the innovation team in the Library and Learning Commons. Meredith's vision for thinking about all the different ways in which we can grow as a district, having a physical locus in the Library and Learning Commons at the middle school has been wonderful. And we're also developing the physical makerspace there and really expanding on the sense, the definition of literacy, the definitions of, um, exp or of learning as exploration. And so the opportunity to really begin to, or circle back to what I said at the beginning, to begin to be a beacon or a lighthouse district um, for the growth of the Learning Commons model and the rethinking of um, the position and the work that we do. I'm now, <laughs> short version, the program I was in for library and learning science this is no longer. And so now I'm in the one at Plymouth State, which is where library and instructional technology specialists began. And as I've begun to take these classes, it's hilarious because people are like, wait, you're doing it. You're this thing that we're trying to invent. Hi, how are you? It's great. Um, so it's really a lovely opportunity to go back to where some of these have begun, to have David coming and speaking. Um, I really feel like we're at this wonderful watershed moment of becoming um, a place where people are looking to better understand the future of libraries. And that is an extraordinary um, opportunity for us. So we want to finish by taking any questions you have um, or explaining other any other resources that we have shown. Um, and as Carolyn said at the beginning, the uh, bookmarks that you have have a QR code, but everything you've seen is accessible through the various drop down menus um, on the Cape LLC website if you'd like to review it later. Okay. Um, it's
It's always exciting. I always love hearing you guys talk. It's fabulous. Um, I know you've got the teachers and the big vision, but I come back to the parents, mm -hmm. and we just go over how you can tell your child is doing something fabulous with their iPad and their screen instead of um, worrying about what they're doing. So just tell us again. I don't think you can tell it enough to parents how you just say flip. What's your, oh. what's the? Sure. Yep. So we, we joke about um, the two eyes, sorry, the two eyes app and the two foot app. So the two eyes app is where you go as a person and walk and look at the screen. And then the two foot app is where you walk over and do the same thing. But getting um, parents very comfortable with asking their students to flip the screen up like this. So just in the classroom we say screens up so that we can see what you're doing. You can see that I'm looking at Google Apps here. Um, another conversation I had with a parent and was a wonderful one about using technology that's in many cable Elizabeth homes. Um, in my own home, we use the Apple TV as a method for displaying what's on the screen. And so this mom was really concerned that her child needed privacy, but also not with the device. So I said, send the child wherever you want and put the screen that they're using on the Apple TV. And I think just developing anything that gives parents a comfort level with it is the state's device, it is Cape Elizabeth's device, it is our device, it is not your student's device, and it is a tool for learning. Um, Amanda and I have had the opportunity to speak um, sponsored by the Cape Elizabeth Middle, the Cape Middle School Elizabeth Parents Association. MSPA. MSPA, thank you. Um, and talk about with parents directly, but we'd love to have more of those conversations in person, on the phone, online, um, about specific strategies, but I think they've all boiled down to ways in which, just like it, the example I've always given is, if they were reading something and the reaction they were having to what they were reading it was concerning, you want to have the same um, reaction you would have. And somehow screens to us mean don't bother me, and really just getting past that as a sensibility so that it is our device. Um, we've also talked a lot about the parking lot and how the terrific resources that Common Sense Media that parents can access. Um, ways to think about what the norms are going to be in your home. And my house really surprises many people because we have a digital parking lot and everyone puts their device on it when you come in the door. And I think people think I have my iPhone strapped to my head at all times or my iPad. Um, and those kinds of delineations. And then when work time starts, it goes up onto the Apple TV and it becomes a, a public or you know, a family experience. So those conversations have been terrific ones to have. And I know you've attended some of those. but. Um, we welcome any opportunities to have those at, at both schools and ways to think about a family dynamic with, um, uh, that encourages conversation about, and about digital citizenship and about how you interact with the device. Thank you. Any other questions? I would just like to say it's amazing, um, you know, how enthusiastic you are and how, and in my household, you've made, you know, not that libraries were never cool, but there's a high, you know, cool factor. And I know Mr. Chartre is not here, but he's uh, very popular um, in, you know, the younger grades. But I would like to say, you know, I remember being at the school board meeting when it was very controversial that the district was going to do something different, libraries were, you know, we were in the box. And I think the fear was uh, we couldn't imagine, you know, how something might look differently. And, you know, we did a lot of feedback on, you know, we can't change the library. It's not broken. You know, we can't see how it's going to improve. So why, why take a risk? But I think this is an amazing example of how um, not being incrementalist and not just making small changes, but dreaming big and making big changes um, has impacted so many people. I know the KP, uh, E team at Coder Express was one of the most amazing things where you have, you know, young students seeing sixth, seventh, eighth graders interested in them. You know, the older guy who you're afraid to talk to, he's so happy to show you, you know, how to do something. And it was such a fantastic experience. And I think it's something, you know, thank you for dreaming big and, um, you know, believing in, in yourselves maybe more than you know um you know you thought but i think you did a fantastic job and keep, keep up the good work thank you i i would like to say that it is because we have the three of us have always felt like because of the way this um position unfolded it, it came with it this permission to 
be drastic and take risks. And um, it, it is very scary. It's a discussion that we had at our innovation team meetings and a lot of other staff meetings. Um, you know, we all have these ideas, these big ideas and these goals, but sometimes when you look at the steps that you'll have to take to get there, um, it can be really overwhelming and there can be so many challenges that come up that make it seem like it's easier to just work with what you have than, than really shake things up. Um, it certainly wasn't easy, but um, if you keep the right goal, long-term goal in mind, um, it, it, we've, we've really been enjoying the, the hard work that we put into it. Um, and we, as we see our position being more involved in offering professional development in the district, uh, we really recognize that we have opportunities to role model these things. Like this is what, um, you know, this is what a team effort on such and such goal looks like. This is what a community effort around something looks like. This is what, um, you know, long-term planning entails and all the challenges we had along the way. Don't ask me how late the shelves were arriving to the library. <laughs> um, but I will say that it, it, a lot of it's because of the, the permissions that we've been given explicitly or otherwise to, to do these, you know, make these drastic changes for the, the long-term good of our students' experiences and our, our staff as well. Any other questions? I just want to say that congratulations and, and bringing our district forward. I really applaud the efforts that you guys, I know the last time you presented to us was a presentation on the whirlwind tour that you had taken of <laughs> other learning commons throughout the region. And right. I was really impressed with what you guys were able to integrate in what you found. When I think about we carry in our pockets more than what the Apollo 13 had trying to find their way home with a slide ruler, yeah. the possibilities that are at our children's fingertips yeah. and you being able to bring that to life for all of us is just completely amazing. And the way that you actually exemplify bringing to life what we've really strived to with our strategic plan is to open up those multiple pathways to learning for our students. Um, you guys are exemplary. So thank, thank you. you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there more to the superintendent's report? <laughs> well, it seems like hardly worth following now, but I'll endeavor on. <laughs> Thank you, Jonathan, Amanda, and Carolyn. I know it's a late night for you. Um, the Coder Express turnout, as you've already heard, was tremendous. We filled the cafeteria at Pond Cove and had to double back for more devices and crash the network. And um, luckily, our intrepid tech director was there to help us as well, So our tech coordinator, Noel Haroff. So thank you to um, everyone involved in that effort. And again, our, our students showed their parents how to use um, coding apps that they had learned to use during the Hour of Code initiative um, at Ponco, which is a national initiative, but during the work that was going on here. So it's, it's pretty fun to see first, second, third grade students teaching their adult parents how to, no mom, you have to put it this way. No, that's a repeat mom. You have to, it's gonna, you, it's not gonna fit if you do it that way. Um, and they're pretty clear about how this is supposed to work. Uh, let's see, middle school spelling bee is coming up. Amanda is otherwise engaged, but uh, the, the spelling bee is... It was last week. We have a snow date scheduled for today. Oh, that's what, okay, that's what was on my calendar, so unnecessary, okay. Do we have a finalist? We have, um, our winner was Raina Sparks, a seventh grader. Um, she is a super engaged Keep us posted on a junkie. <laughs> uh, we will be hosting a substitute teacher training on January 28th from 6.30 to 8 at the Middle School Library Learning Commons. Another great use of that space, but we are always looking for substitute teachers, so if you're interested, you can call the district office or sign up online to attend that event, and, um, or call us later. You can still get a sub application, but it's an opportunity for folks who may just be thinking about substituting to get some more information about what that might entail. Um, tomorrow night, 
I'll be meeting with Russell Packett and Jane Golding with some of our local preschool providers just to talk about our ideas about moving the preschool program forward um, that currently exists at Community Services and how we will look at a potential school partnership for that program as the state potentially makes some funding available, further funding available for pre-K. Um, you've already heard again about the Google Apps for Families night coming up on January 29th. We have coming up in February an elementary parent, or excuse me, not an elementary, but a parent night on differentiated instruction with Dr. Michael Shackelford. Some more information about that will be coming out in my newsletter, hopefully this week. On February 3rd and 4th, the elementary school has concerts for 3rd and 4th graders. Let's see, Steve Wessler, you may remember from our board meeting last spring talking about climate and culture, is doing a training the end of this week, next week next week with middle school and high school staff and students that train the trainer piece to really look at school climate and culture, um, civil rights, how respectful we are to one another. Um, and again, all of that aligns with our district vision and mission and is a CEF grant holdover. So have the kids for that training been identified? And it's a work in progress. Work in progress, okay. I mentioned earlier that we received just preliminary information about the governor's budget and his plan for general purpose aid. So again, at this point, the governor's budget proposes level funding for general purpose aid, but the Essential Programs and Services Committee, as a subcommittee of the Education Committee, has made some recommendations that um, add some funding in some places and move funding around in other areas. And so that uh, report has yet to be presented to the full Education Committee and how that will impact the budget overall, we don't know, and so it's, again, very early on in that process. We had, uh, let's see, you heard the date for Cape Celebrates Literacy Week, and Author Fest will be April 11th. Again, that coincides with the Maine Association of School Libraries Spring Fling, which is an exciting opportunity for us, and um, authors are signing up left and right, so our, our ranks are building, which is exciting. I uh, shared our information on enrollment updates. There's a January report in your board agenda, but we expect to have a report from planning decisions, hopefully for the January workshop. Can, can you just describe for those who may not be familiar who planning decisions is? Scott, would you care to speak to that for us? Who planning decisions is there, who they are, what they do? Scott Wyman is our business administrator, for those of you who Thank don't you. know him. Thank you. I'm unprepared, so I'll be very quick. Planning Decisions is an organization that actually studies population growth, and we've um, engaged them to actually look at our population and do a five-year forecast. Um, the data begins actually with live births in the area and for residents of Cape Elizabeth. So we look at the live births this year, and the implication that they would then start, children would start five years later in Cape Elizabeth, and when it's a rotating uh, five-year birth record. And so the indications are, and not all like, un, unlike the state of Maine is, we're, we're losing our, our younger student population. Um, we've also asked them to look at the research on the resale of homes as people turn over their homes and what is the impact of future families coming in with um, school-aged children and to see if that impact will be different than just the birth record itself because there seems to be some changeover in real estate. So as retirees pretend each either, either leave, uh, leave the community or, um, or stay, and there's that whole committee of how to stay and stay at home now, what, what are the implications for um, young families moving into Cape Elizabeth? So that data will give us a, a real good direction. It's interesting the way they do the modeling, um, and they're fairly accurate when they do that. So but we are looking at a decreasing population. Uh, we should see, I'm guessing, looking at um, the early data that says instead of an incoming class of 100, which we might anticipate from previous history in the last few years, is that we're looking at really about 85 students. And that, seemed, that trend seems to be um, consistent. Mm -hmm. Thank so, you. So hopefully that data will be, it will be a thorough report, it'll be a full report on how they actually develop the data and what does it mean for us. It'll be interesting to see those numbers. Any questions about planning decisions? Uh, of course, they work with um, the town council and Maureen O'Mara mm -hmm. um, to get their point of view and with the history. Yeah. Of sure. course. Absolutely. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Continuing. Continuing. 
Um, Smarter Balance testing window opens up in March, and so there are a lot of logistical preparations that are taking place for that. In fact, just today we got an email from the interim technology coordinator at the state to say, great news, they're going to have an iOS um, update that will make uh, iPads compatible with the actual assessment, which is something that has been long awaited, but as, as this window draws closer, there's growing anxiety. Um, to say the least. So um, Ruth Ellen Vaughn, our Director of Instruction, and Noel Haroff, our Technology Coordinator, are working with building principals to try to schedule the timing of those assessments and sort out some of the logistical pieces that need to be in place. When you have students testing school-wide, as we do at the middle school, you have to be really thoughtful about what's the capacity of our network and, and how can it support all of that. And again, we won't be testing probably all four grade levels simultaneously at any point, but we really need to be just thoughtful about the parameters um, for the assessment. Um, enclosed in your board packet was a report from the University of Maine, and that's a report that we have shared annually for at least the last handful of years, I think, I don't know, two or three maybe. Um, it just gives us some general information about our students who attend UMaine programs only, so it's not, it doesn't include students, that, this particular report doesn't include students who are attending universities out of state, um, but it does gives, give us a little bit of comparison information as to how our students fare compared to students statewide. Um, you know, one piece of information, for example, is that 68% of our students were still enrolled after a year compared to 78% of students statewide. And so that's a question for us. You know, are our kids not properly matched? Are they, you know, struggling academically? Are there other pieces that are presenting a challenge for them? And this report alone doesn't give us that data, but it is, it is a clue to us that there may be some additional questions that we want to ask as we move forward. And I know the high school guidance department and Jeff have been working on developing an alumni survey. And so it's, it's those kinds of questions that you might expect to see in a survey to help get at what is it that is getting in the way for students if they perceive anything to be getting in the way of their success um, after they leave Cape Elizabeth High School. That's great. <laughs> Uh, last week, I guess, um, I had a book group meeting on our book discussion on the book How Children Succeed, and Bill uh, was there along with Ruth Ellen and a handful of other folks. And um, the discussion really centered around, you know, how is stress impacting kids in our school district? What's, when is it too much stress? Uh, how, how are we um, supporting kids in dealing with that? And um, again, there's an article probably about a month and a half old now um, in the Huffington Post that I think speaks really eloquently to the kinds of stress that we see in students and um, concerns that I've heard from students since I've been here and that people who are involved in the mission, vision, and strategic planning process heard from kids and parents and stakeholders and feedback that I continue to get, including an email from a parent a couple of weeks ago who was talking about the um, anxiety that her child was feeling going into the last week of school prior to the vacation, exams and papers and that just dread, um, you know, that a, a young high school student was feeling already. And uh, I think we have a responsibility as a community to kind of address that, talk about that, bring that issue in, into the forefront and, and think about how we're supporting our kids as they move into their futures. I think the article that I will share um, in my newsletter this week, and I'll put a link to it on our um, website, speaks about this um, sense that many kids have that everything they're doing is about getting into a great college. And that sometimes they get there and they don't know what's next. And so they're acting out in different ways with you know, substance abuse or um, sexual activity, uh, <laughs> cutting, anorexia, um, those kinds of issues because they aren't, they aren't really sure what lies ahead. They've invested all this time and energy into getting into college, and yet now they're there. And there may not be a job for them when they graduate, or it may not be in something that they're really excited about because they're not sure what they've excited about, what they're excited about because they kind of lost their way in just trying to meet all the demands. And so, I, again, I think that it's a thought-provoking article, and, and I would encourage parents to have a conversation with their children about where they sit um, with these issues. Again, do I think that every child in Cape Elizabeth feels that way? Of course not, but I do think it is, it's a concern that I have heard repeatedly uh, in my time here. So I would encourage people to, to read on that. Um, in March, I'll be reading um, the book discussion book will be World Class Learners by Yang Zhao. Um, so we'll put information up about that title as well. 
Our robotics program is full at the seams and bursting. They have wait lists for all of their programs. Um, we are in, in preliminary discussions about whether or not it makes sense to offer a course for credit at the high school, uh, potentially doing that outside of the normal school day to give um, kids whose schedules are already very full some flexibility in participating in that program. Yesterday, Scott and I met with representatives from our three parents associations to talk about liability coverage. Our parents associations fall in um, sort of a tricky place. They're not covered by the municipality because we don't oversee their books or audit their funds or approve any of their expenditures. Um, they aren't incorporated necessarily as 501c3s like the Education Foundation might be, and so they fall into this sort of Officially, they're an unincorporated body, I guess, is the, is the title the insurance company might use. But just to meet with them to make sure that they understand what liability they might have. Um, certainly, any activity that we sponsor as a district that they support, that's our liability. But there are events that they sponsor, um, like the Pond Cove Challenge, uh, Harvest Festival, that, where that they assume a fair amount of liability. And so we wanted to make sure they understood those pieces. and. Um, have a conversation about how we can support them with that. We had a similar conversation with our booster organizations at the high school um, back in early December. So again, there's some conversation among those groups right now about how to move forward, um, conversations you know, for our booster groups in particular about equity of funding, Title IX obligations, and, and how do we balance that out. So. Um, it, not to, learning. not to get into the weeds about that during your superintendent's report, but are there other models from other districts that do close or reduce that, that risk? Well, there are a number of ways for groups to approach that. I mean, if you're sp speaking specifically about Title IX, um, yes, I mean, it, it can happen in a number of ways. Some groups might choose to form one booster organization and, and handle it that way. The other way that it's handled, excuse me, is to have, which is what, what we have in place currently, um, where groups turn in their reports to us of their expenditures, and we have a responsibility to kind of review those expenditures with an eye to equity. So is the softball team, you know, presuming an equal number of members and equal, roughly equal costs for training and equipment, having the same amount of money spent on its program as the baseball team? Mm -hmm. And so those are kinds of issues that we put on the table and had some good conversation about, I think. Thank you for that work. Yeah. The only other thing I think on my list was um, in mid-December, I was able to attend the superintendent's uh, advisory council meeting of the college board. And that um, meeting included roughly a dozen other superintendents from across the country um, talking about, hearing from the college board about some of the changes that they're making to assessments. I think that reflect, um, on their part anyway, a realization that analogies aren't all that matters anymore. Um, they're really trying to connect their assessments much more to content um, learning that's occurring in schools today. I think they're also being very thoughtful about equity and access um, to opportunities. Um, I'm sure folks have heard college, people thinking about college have heard um, about their partnerships with Khan Academy, some of that work, um, but you know, it's a unique opportunity for those of us who are there to um, have a you know, conversation and in a room you know, about the size of these couple of tables put together with um, David Coleman, president of the college board, and to give him some feedback about what we see as needs, um, both the very large urban districts as well as smaller districts um, in more rural areas like ours. What an amazing opportunity. Yeah. Being in the throes of just submitting various college applications, I can tell you that I was really surprised at the number of schools that are now popping up, and Sarah, you can, I'm sure, speak to this too, um, that SATs or ACTs are actually optional, and that many schools now have alternative electronic, um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Portfolios. Portfolios that you can upload to show your learning in other ways as well, so that aligning the way in which we deliver assessments in our own district can maybe help meet some of the ways in which the college board, which really is the game, um, 
also looks at that. That's yeah. a really interesting. I, I think it's a growing trend. I think, unfortunately, the default for many places is still to look at those scores. But, but I, I would predict, as just as we think, that at some point the rising costs in higher ed are going to break um, because it's not sustainable. I think you're going to see a similar trend with things like ACT and SAT and the emphasis on those scores. I think, I, I think that's a shift that's coming for us as a society. Not in the next year or two. <laughs> <laughs> Mayor, not to go off topic, but just one feedback on, on assessments. Um, you know, I think um, one thing we should look at is um, you know having a common um, language to discuss assessments. A child may say, oh, I'm, "I'm being assessed for this," and the message is, "Well, that's that's how we can assess how the teachers are teaching you." But there's another assessment that the kids say, "Oh." You know, or that's the one you have, you're being assessed, so you you can you get more, or in their mind, more or less. So it may be helpful, um, and I, you know, uh, to have some sort of common language so everyone's on the same not the same page. It's difficult. Families are going to communicate it differently, but I think that would help. Or that's an idea or a no. suggestion, just so like smarter balance. You know, someone asked me, though those are coming up, and I'm on the school board, and I would tell them. I don't really have a clue what those are, but I'm sure I'll get some message, you know, a few days before that, you know, that's going to happen. So I don't have an idea, but I hear it so much, and it's so stressful that, you know. Yeah, that, and um, I, th I think there's a lot we can do, you know, again, collaboratively to sort of ratchet down that stress. I mean, assessments generally are, we're just seeing how your learning's going, right? We're trying to check in with you about what you're learning how you're growing as a reader, how we can help you be better at that, how you're growing as a mathematician and how we can help you with that. It, you know, I, I think we've, we've created, or our society has created this huge emphasis on the end result and really it's about the process and, and I think that's our work as educators is to support children in growing as learners and you know, the more that we can sort of back down that stress, the better off I think our kids are, but it's also an opportunity for, you know, for us, we do need to speak more with parents about it. You know, we use the word assessment, we throw it around all the time because it's just part of what we do and there are different types of assessments, but to help students and parents better understand that I think is, is a good message, so I appreciate that feedback. Is there any more for your superintendent's report? I hope not. <laughs> Any other questions or comments for our superintendent on her report? Okay. Thank you very much for that um, detailed report. Um, on to new business, number six on our agenda this evening. Um, may I have a motion around the Cape Elizabeth Paz budget? Yes. Uh, I wish I could do all these next five items as well. Motion, but I can't. Um, I move that we approve. <laughs> Please, David. I'm waiting for some uh, amendments. Or uh, I move that we approve Cape Elizabeth Pass Part One and Two budget costs for 2015-16 in the amount of $55,152.37, and uh, Part One is $54,640.68. Part Two, $511.69. Wow. May I have a second? second. <laughs> so okay. Discussion. So just as, again, a reminder to the board and um, to folks at home who may not be familiar with this process, PATH's tuition is based on an average attendance, um, and we're assessed based on our first two years attendance. So um, you can see that our attendance in October of 2012 was nine and 10 students in 2013, and so we're billed for nine and a half students' worth of the cost. Questions, comments, concerns? I think PASS is a great program. I wish more students would look into it and um, that we could make part day, full day um, options for them. It's outstanding. Um, so I appreciate the work that we're doing to support students who go to PASS from middle school on through high school. So they get the idea in their head. It's a, it's a possibility. It's a choice. There are options. Yep. There are multiple pathways. Yes, there are. No pun intended. May I have a uh, show of hands and support? Seven. Seven. Thank you. 
May I have a motion in regards to the World Affairs Council trip? Yes, to you may. I move that we approve a World <laughs> Affairs Council trip to Dartmouth College Model UN Conference April 10th to 12th, 2015. Second. I second the motion. Any comments, questions, or concerns? If I could just clarify, just, it, we're approving the trip set, as set forth in the National Student uh, Agenda. Michael. As included in our packet this evening? Yes. Say yes. So yes, Michael. Are you suggesting an amendment to the motion? A clarification. A clarification. Are you okay with this clarification? I absolutely okay with it. Are there further comments, questions, or concerns? All those in favor? Seven. Thank you. May I have a motion around the girls' tennis team trip to Hilton Head, South Carolina, in April? I move that we approve the girls' tennis team trip to Hilton Head, South Carolina, April 18th to 25th, 2015, as set forth in our agenda. A second. Second. Any questions, comments, or concerns? Coach Beckel is here if there are specific questions related to the trip. Oh. We always ask, but I think it helps. Uh, <laughs> Students and uh, is it made is the opportunity available for uh, you know all students high school students I'm not sure just to get an idea of who, who? Uh, all high school te uh, students that um, play tennis or have interest in tennis at the one of the since about August September October so yes there's plenty of opportunities and are there opportunities for fundraising to support students who have a hard time. Um, Maybe we the haven't feet. done any fundraising because it's not a, a mandatory, I don't make it a mandatory event. I have a lot of kids, I only have about five hours away this year. Usually we have a lot of the lot of juniors so they can college stuff. Yep. And you'd bring it to our attention or bring it to Jeff Thorax or Jeff Shedd's attention if there was someone who wanted to go who but didn't have the funds? Absolutely. Thank you. Um, is there an opportunity, and I know that this is something that, um, per policy, we need to ask, is there an, a similar, cheaper opportunity available closer to home during that time span that the students could take advantage of that would be less expensive or more fun? Um, well, Danny Stroud, who was the girls' team before, so he has been going out of the for one year, and he's been And so that's sort of, we built a really nice relationship with the Van Meter family to really create it. But um, I have a lot of girls who take tennis lessons in the winter here for active fitness center. Um, so there's opportunity for um, tennis, but this is an opportunity to go south and have different experience training by really top-notch coaches and work with players that live at the academy and train to be tennis players. Isn't it somewhat unique in that it is in the south, it is in the hot-headed tennis, that we're playing against kids that play tennis year-round with some of the top uh, instructors, so it isn't really something you can't do compared to New England. You can't oh, do yeah. something. No, it's, it's definitely. I mean, there's opportunity for kids to play tennis here. Right, but it's not at the level. That level of competition. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. He's just ready to vote. All those in favor? <laughs> Seven. Thank you. Enjoy it. Yeah. We can leave. <laughs> oh, may I have a motion in regards to Ted Jordan's AP Governor class trip to Washington, D.C.? I move that we approve Ted Jordan's AP government class trip to Washington, D.C., March 25th to 27th, 2015, as set forth in our agenda packet. Second. I second. Thank you. Any questions, comments, concerns? I would just say this is a recurring trip, but it's a slight change in date from when they normally go. I think they've normally gone in April. Am I correct? Yes. And is the 25th to the 27th, is there a break in March? No. Well, it falls around the conference window in March, I believe. It's not a break, per se, but I believe there is a release day for conferences or partial release day somewhere that week. Okay. 
actually people are looking at me like I don't know what I'm talking about, so I may not. But I somewhere in the back of my mind think that there is a conference so, meeting today that week. Familiar. Okay. All those in favor? Seven. Thank you. Um, may I have a motion regarding the co-curricular staff nominations? Yes, I move that we approve the following athletic co-curricular staff nominations as listed in the agenda packet, item 6E. Second. Second. Thank you. Discussion? So I'm gonna, uh, the boys expansion, basketball, is that? Happy to speak to that. Really, it's a, it, it comes up when we need it. Okay. Um, we essentially set aside some money budgetarily in the event that we have more students try out for teams than, than we normally have budgeted for coaches. And I think we had a girls' expansion team last year. This year, it's a boys' expansion team. Some years, we have no expansion team. But we try not to cut students from the middle school program. That's great. <coughs> I, I, I'm just not sure <laughs> why I'm... Um, why, why they, um, like in the grade seventh, why they can't be on one team? I mean, why can't there be a rotation? Why does there have to be an expansion team? I think there are just too many students, and so they would have very limited playing time if you had only one team. I think with 30 students, your, your playing time in a, in a quarter is almost non-existent. It's only five can play at a time, yeah. Yeah, no, I just, uh, I'm wondering just because I, I feel badly for the expansion team. Sure. I, um, I think most sports have sort of caps on how many people you can put on a roster, and so you can't have, you know, 30 yeah. students on your roster, so yeah. you field two teams. And so, Sam, I think it's a good question, but have, having played on these way, way back, the fact you get to play is more important than whether you're on the number one team or the number two team or whatever. The fact you get to play is, is really what's the important thing. Yeah, no, I know. I just know that the um, expansion team, because I have a son on the expansion team, has f f far fewer games than, well, that's a different than, question. The, than the other team. And so that, that was new to me, and yeah. I didn't realize there was a roster limit. Yeah, I think the challenge in scheduling is trying to then other, find other equivalent experiences with, yeah. ex with other schools. Right. And uh, because these numbers sometimes aren't known to us until students right. sign up at the time, it can be difficult to add games to the schedule. Yeah. All those in favor? Seven. <coughs> well, that concludes basically our new business item six. Sorry that wasn't as quick as you would have liked it there, Michael. Um, on to number seven um, item on our agenda this evening, committee reports. Um, do the chairs of our newly formed committees have any fun facts they'd like to share? I, I would just share briefly what I shared with the policy committee earlier today, which is, has to do mostly with your work, Joe. Um, as the chair of that committee um, and, and, and the work of the administrators uh, on the committee even more so. Um, that as part of our long-running long process to review um, the, the school board's uh, policies, um, the policy committee has, has reviewed and, and the board has re, um, revised and adopted um, a total of, a, or, or deleted from board, the board policy level. And, um, um, demoted to sort of administrative policy, a total of 193 policies out of 251, which is about 77 percent. So the end is in sight. Um, about 66 policies were 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 um, reviewed and 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 deleted. So we think that's about a third of the, the total number that have been looked at. Um, so I think that suggests a, a more uh, nimble. Um, policy manual that, that allows administrators to be, um, you know, to be to be administrating more frequently without trips to the board to um, to have uh, to make uh, changes that don't require board involvement. Uh, so that's my that's my update today. Um, junior class officers were at the meeting to uh, uh, advocate for 
a change to policy JHCA, uh, which is the use of unscheduled class time for high school seniors, through which seniors can, um, uh, can leave the campus if they don't have a class. Um, they did a great job presenting on behalf of their, their class, and um, I, I think we'll be able to um, uh, put forward a policy that makes, um, makes uh, at least some of that time available to them more flexibly. So. Excellent. That's Natalie, I understand that you um, attended today's meeting to bring forth your proposal. Um, I, I, for one, would really like to applaud you and your class officers for being so forthcoming and thinking about how to benefit um, not only yourselves, because the, the window of opportunity for you to enjoy the fruits of your labor will be narrow, but to think about your legacy leaving behind, that's really helpful. Thank you, John. Uh, we knew we would be putting the policy committee in good hands. Thank you, Michael, would you like to share anything about finance? Uh, I do, but I, I'll do it as part of the uh, upcoming meetings. Okay. Any other um, committee appointments um, that we want to report out for committee work? I will just note that we will need to set up negotiations teams for our um, bargaining with our custodial facilities, food staff, transportation um, group, as well as with our um, EdTech 1 administrative support and EdTech 2 and 3 bargaining units. So okay. that we should appoint those committees at an upcoming meeting. Excellent. Um, Kate and I, it looks like you and I have some discussion <laughs> around those. Um, excellent. Any other um, comments or questions or concerns around committee reports? I'm just saying that, gosh, PATHS hasn't met since November, so there's no update other than you know, approving the budget. And um, although I'm, the, the, the uh, innovation, innovation Committee has met twice now, we were supposed to meet a third time in December, um, and that will get rescheduled, but it's, it's off to a great start with Meredith's help. We're excited to hear what comes out of that. I'm meeting. excited to see it go. Excellent, thank you. Okay, seeing no more questions, comments, or concerns on committee reports. Um, are there any items from either the board members or the public on upcoming school board agenda for requests? Don't all speak at once. All right, seeing none. Um, announcements of upcoming meetings. Michael. Uh, the next uh, workshop and finance meeting is January 27th. Uh, just to make sure everyone understands this very clearly, we will be discussing some uh, long, longer term uh, drivers of school spending and revenue, such as you know uh, enrollment, um, you know wage growth, uh, and contracts. Uh, but let me be specific, we are not discussing any uh, particular budget items. Um, the budget won't be presented till February 10th, so I didn't want anyone to be confused in here. Oh, they spoke about the budget on January 27th. We're gonna discuss, you know, trends like enrollment, um, you know, state revenue, some fuel costs, some buildings and grounds. So um, I didn't want anyone to be confused. The budget will not be presented till uh, February 10th. Excellent. And to reiterate, if there are any questions for upcoming workshops, if you would like to submit those questions once reviewing the budget materials, um, if you want to submit questions to be considered during the workshop, you can go to the school board, school board contact, where I believe that there you can hit on the entire school board contact, but I can also just hit on an email from Michael so that you can be prepared and gather as much information and consideration both with our superintendent and our business manager beforehand so we can intelligently answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Any other announcements of upcoming meetings? Just the board retreat this Friday from 8 a.m. to 11 a.m. at St. Albans, that's posted. Um, the workshop on January 27th, the evaluation committee meets January 29th. The subcommittee will also meet on for student growth and 
student growth members, student growth measures is meeting Thursday as other subcommittee uh, working groups. And the policy committee agreed to meet on the fourth Tuesday of each month starting on February 24th at 3 p.m. in the Jordan Room for one and a half hours. Could you stand? Say that again, please. <laughs> Sir, <laughs> says the policy committee member. Who wasn't at the meeting. I'll write it down for you. Um, also, the Hope, Me Hope is meeting tomorrow night at 7.30 at the Cape Elizabeth High School Learning Commons. Excellent. Thank you for remembering that. Um, Steve, coming up, any meetings? Have we... I haven't um, been in touch with them yet. There, they, one moment. I believe they have an executive board meeting coming up. Okay. I can't see my calendar well enough to tell you when it is. But I'm but sure it's on sure their website. Barbara has yeah. that who, who would be Mike? Um, um, probably Mike Wood. Or Jim Britt or Mike Wood, and I can send you their contact information. Their meetings are all posted on their um, on their website. Home, home website. Yep. And I know that we are actually, you just brought up a very good point, I know that we're just turning over to our new committee assignments. Is everyone hooked up with the committees that they've been signed up for? Wellness needs um, to get connected, which Barbara and I and Meredith can talk with um, okay. wellness. And all the others are pretty ad hoc. Um, community Services Advisory Board, David, been having fun over at the Community Services Building yet? Uh, nothing to report. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, well, if there are any other announcements about kind meetings, I just had a quick question reminder of the agenda for Friday. Yes, Andrea yes. will be sending it out hopefully tomorrow. Okay. Um, seeing no more questions, comments, or concerns about um, upcoming meetings, um, back to the most important item on tonight's agenda. May I have a motion to adjourn? <laughs> so moved. So moved. Can I do that? I think, oh. Is it a motion? <laughs> All right, so this is my Town first. Council does. have a motion? Town Council says yeah. so moved. Okay. David, does that work? Really? No. Do I care? No. <laughs> Oh, we do vote. We have to vote. hold us to it. Or have a second. All those in favor? Yes. Yeah. All right. Thank you. I'm just so excited to gavel.